Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we don't, do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, he who searches the heart knows the mind of the, what the mind of the Spirit is, because He makes intercessions for the saints according to the will of God. And God, we just ask that you would bless our consideration of this text, that your spirit would come, who would aid us in prayer, would now aid us in understanding your instruction to us. And we ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. I think all of us know that we as human beings are fraught with weakness. That, uh, that weakness is the result of the fall of man and sin, and that weakness has impacted us physically, it's impacted us intellectually, it's impacted us psychologically, it, uh, it is expressed in times in which we have great energy, great mental energies, for example, and then other times when we don't. I can take my Bible and on one day I can read it, and it's every word jumps off a page as a new and wonderful discovery, and I find myself on the heights of illumination, and then the very next day I can find myself, maybe you've done this before, reading the same passage of Scripture over and over again. Not because I'm in wonderment at what it said, but because I'm wondering what I just read. I forget it before the word has passed my mind. And well, this is just an example of the, the weakness of our flesh. It modulates from day to day. One day you can wake up and feel like you're ready to tackle the world. And the next day you wake up and for no reason, apparent reason, you feel as though the world has tackled you and you haven't even begun the day yet. That's just the way it is with us in this fallen sinful body we have. But Here's the promise that God gives us in this passage. The Spirit helps us with our weaknesses. The Spirit understands. God knows that we are, we are but flesh. God is careful with us. The Bible speaks of the Lord Jesus as one who doesn't quench the flickering wick or break the bruised reed. He's gentle and careful with us. The Lord Jesus himself called us and said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He knows our condition. He knows our struggles. He knows our weakness, and he... He calls us to himself and he, he works to minister to us and uphold us and carry us. And here it says the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. And the word help there is the idea of one who comes along to share the load with us. It's the image of an individual who's trying to carry something that is awkward and unwieldy. And another comes along and gets the other side of that thing and helps them lift it up. And so the Spirit comes to help us carry the loads that we have and one of the more unwieldy loads that you have to carry in life is yourself you can't figure it out there's some complexities about yourself there's an awkwardness you know it about your own self and your own attitudes and the way that you approach life from day to day and well you're not married you're not made to live your life and carry through on your life and carry your life through from day to day by yourself the Holy Spirit has come to carry along the side of you, to assist you and help you in this. And now it's important that you notice something here. The word there, helps, doesn't mean carry instead of. It doesn't mean to carry instead of. The word help there means that he comes to assist us in the struggle. He comes to lift alongside of us. He comes to help us. But he doesn't come to do it for us, which is actually quite amazing. It's going to be applied to this area of prayer. And to tell you the truth, prayer has always been a bit of a mystery to me. I haven't entirely understood it. If God knows all things, if God is all powerful and all knowing and he's all wise, he knows exactly what needs to be done in any given moment, whether I ask him for it or not. And so why does God ask me to pray? And all I can say is that's the pattern of God all along. God is all-powerful and almighty and can accomplish everything by a fiat of his word. And yet God has so ordained things and God's desire is that we might become agents carrying out his will and his purpose. And so he's constantly working through agency. God, who is able to create all the world in a flourish, and in a moment by just a proclamation was to create all of the universe in six days, then gave a command that we were to be fruitful and multiply. Why should we be fruitful and multiply? God, you were able to do this wonderfully all by yourself god's design and god's purpose the all-powerful god's design and purpose is that this expression of fruitfulness might rise from creatures that live in submission obedience to, and obedience to him 
God gives the law to Moses, and the law is written on stone tablets for no, Moses, for us to read. And it's all written out by God's own divine hand. And why did the God not do that for all of Scripture? Since God is able to give Scripture that way, why work through the agency of men who would write down His Word? Or through, as Hebrews tells us, angels who would deliver that message to men who would then write down the Word. Well, God is exalted and God has designed it that He might work through agency. He might work through us in that way. And in the same way, God has commanded us to pray and to be a people of prayer. God has determined that He is going to pursue and He is going to fulfill His purposes through our prayers and our yieldedness. To prayer. Take your Bible for a moment and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you'll see an example of this. Look down at verse 8. Paul writes, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened, burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and does deliver us, and whom we trust He will still deliver us. God is been with us in the present. God was with us in the past. We know, we trust He's going to be with us in the future. God is the one who's the agent of delivery. He's the one who does all this for us. He does all this work. End of sentence. No. Then he goes on to say, you also, helping together in prayer for us, but thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. I'm thankful for you, the fact that you're praying for me. God has delivered me. You also helping us through prayer. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing that God has condescended to his creatures to delight in his creatures as we answer in obedience to him, and he gives us the dignity of agency. He gives us a role to play that he will not fulfill apart from us being obedient to that role. And so he calls upon us. I read in the book of Revelation, the account where at the end of the age that God is going to send two angels across all the earth to proclaim the everlasting gospel. And you might ask yourself, now why didn't God do that at the very beginning of the age instead of the end of the age? Because at this time in the age, he's commanded us to go to all the ends of the earth to proclaim the gospel. It's to be our responsibility. Our job. God has determined in His sovereign wisdom to work through our agency. And so God commands us to pray. And then God says, But I won't leave you alone in your prayers. You're weak in that. I'll help you. I'll send my spirit to help you. But still, it's our work to do. It's our life to live. It's our prayers that need to be prayed. And so let's start right here in the passage. It's our weakness in prayer. We we have to pray because it's to be commanded, just as we've said. And, and God has told us to do as such. And you can read through the Scripture. And I think if we took time to read through the New Testament and we were to find the imperatives in the New Testament, we would discover that the imperatives that are given to the church, the lion's share of imperatives, lie around this very idea of being a people that pray, that we're to be praying all the time, unceasingly praying, that we're to pray for one another, that we're to pray for our nation, that we're to pray for the lost, that we'll pray for the kings, we're to pray for laborers to go out into the field and to raise up more people to go out to proclaim the gospel and to harvest those that would come to Christ. We have been commanded to pray. The other thing is that we discover that prayer is a central part of the Christian life because our life as Christians began with prayer on our lips. It was our life with the Lord Jesus began, our life of confidence, salvation in Jesus Christ began when we opened up a conversation with God. And the first thing we usually said was, Oh God, be merciful. God, forgive me. God, cleanse me. And God, transform me and change me. And Lord Jesus, come and transform me. And I take hold of you and I believe in you. And There is at that very moment when we come to Christ an impulse that's born within us to carry on an ongoing conversation with God, to continue to pray and meet Him and to converse with Him and to engage Him. And so it's also a part of the, the supernatural rebirth that we had, that it was a birth into a conversation with God that begins. And 
we also not only have this command and this impulse, but we know somewhat how to pray. The Lord Jesus taught us. He taught us that when we were to pray, we were to, we were to address the first person of the triune God, the Father. And we were to pray in, to Him directly, saying, Our Father, hallowed be Thy name. And then He explained to us as we came before the Father that we were to pray and offer up our prayer in His name, in Jesus' name. That is, that our approach before the Father and our praise and our petitions and our supplications and our call upon Him for deliverance and help all of that, all of those prayers were to be coming to him through the name of Jesus Christ and through his work. And we spoke about this a few weeks ago, that as we come before God, this idea of praying in Jesus' name is the idea of waving before God the sacrifice of our Savior Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins as the, the basis of our approach and our relationship with him. And so we know something of how we're supposed to pray. And as we've mentioned here by these commands, we also know some of the things we're supposed to be praying for. You can read the book of Ephesians, or you can read the book of Colossians, and you'll see there where Paul is offering all kinds of different prayers, and he'll pray for the church. He'll pray that they would grow in a deeper knowledge of God. They, he prays that they'd grow in wisdom, and that they'd grow in understanding, and that they would have an expanding knowledge of God's love, and of God's power, and of the hope that they have in store for them one day in heaven. He, he prays that they would be filled with all the fullness of God, that the Spirit of God would inhabit and begin filling their lives. He prays that the love of Christ would be expressed in them. He's praying for an experience of God's life upon them, to come upon them. And then he, he, he encourages them to pray, for example, at the end of chapter Ephesians, to, to pray as they square off against the enemy, the devil, and all of his wiles and all of his attacks against us, as they're arm themselves. And as they're arming themselves in the panoply of all that Christ gives them of his own provision, they're to stand together in prayer against the wiles of the enemy and then Paul also asked that they pray that a, a great door of opportunity would come before them for the proclamation and declaration of the gospel and that their words would be incisive and power in the lives of those who hear of the Savior. And on and on, we know some of the things that we're supposed to be praying for as well. So here we are, we're, we're commanded to pray. We're born again to pray. We, it comes from us quite naturally. We know something of how we should pray, and we even know something of what we are to pray for. And still, we're weak in prayer. We struggle in prayer. We come to it with our challenges and our difficulties, and we stumble at this very moment in time. Paul says, we don't know how we should pray as we ought. We don't know how to do it. So let's start right there. Look at this for just a moment through this passage. And see what the instruction here is. And the first thing that we should start with in coming to prayer in the right way is to come to it knowing that we don't know how to do it as we ought. Some of the most wonderful, effective prayers are prayed for the, by those who are learning to pray for the first time. They have yet to learn the rules. They've yet to, yet to sit and listen to the eloquence of some old person praying and they just cut to the chase. And they just say those things that are burgeoning up in their hearts. And they don't even know the word burgeon, right? They just say whatever is coming up, they just shout it out. And it's so simple and it's so to the point and it's so potent and powerful. And God hears it and God answers it. Here's an individual who's very learned. His prayers are the inspiration for our prayers. Uh, I have a number of books that are written on the prayers of Paul. The prayers of Paul. And yet here is Paul saying, we... Do not know how to pray as we ought. See that? He didn't say, you don't know how to pray as you ought. I'll show you. I'll teach you. Paul says, we do not know how to pray as we ought. And sometimes you might have an individual ask you to pray for them. And if you're like me, the thought is, I have no idea how to. I have no idea how to address your life and pray for your life. I, I hardly know how to pray for my own life. There are a few reasons why I think we're weak in prayer. There might be more than this, but let me give you three. The first one is, our life is such a bundle of needs, we don't know where to begin. Right? If you look at your life, your life is nothing but a succession of dependency upon dependency upon dependency. It's such a, a tangle and mesh of interwoven needs of dependence that you, you don't even know how to approach and how to pray. It's, it's where do I begin? What do I ask for? You know, if you ask a person, this happens oftentimes when you're a group of individuals, and are there any prayer requests or any prayer needs, and no one has a prayer need, they're not thinking. 
They're not even trying. The fact is, if you ask the question, you get most, most thought of it, you, you'd have to actually say, I want to limit this to one or two prayer needs. Because once you start really honestly looking at your life, you could just go through an endless cascade of needs that are in your life. It's upon your life on a regular basis. So one of our weaknesses, frankly, is we just don't know how to identify the proper need in the middle of all the needs because we're just drowning in we're surrounded by needs. That's a part of our weakness. It's a, it's a vast and boundless list of things that I need, so what do I pray for? Another one of the reasons we're weak in prayer is because we're in the midst of the sea of needs. We're ignorant of the things that we need the most. We're ignorant of the things that we need the most. We don't know the thing that we should be praying for above everything else. And so we can be in going through circumstances and challenges and difficulties in the midst of the circumstances and challenges and difficulties, we begin to apply ourselves in prayer. And many times, we're actually praying for the wrong thing. We're in the middle of this thing, and we're asking God to help us and deliver us or answer a need. And we're asking for a certain objective to be fulfilled. And, and He has no intention of meeting us and working in us in that area or that direction. We're, we're praying in the wrong direction altogether. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 Paul describes a time in his life when he was praying for the wrong thing. He's praying, he's got a thorn in the flesh. I'm assuming this is some physical weakness, some malady that's coming upon him, something that he's not seemingly being able to overcome. And he says that three times he asked for God to remove the thorn from his flesh. And finally, God answers Paul and says, Paul, I'm not going to answer that prayer. I'm not going to answer that prayer. I, I want to work through your weakness. I want to work through you in your weakness because in your weakness my strength is made perfect. My goal is not to take this away. My, pull is not to, my goal is not to answer. I gave it to you. I sent that to your way. So you'd lean on to me. You'd trust in me. and I could show you what I could do in the midst of your weakness. So one of the reasons our weakness is that we have so many needs that we don't even know how to identify what we should pray for. The second one is, even when we're in circumstances where we do, get, do begin to pray, we don't pray for the right things. We don't know what is the right thing to pray for. And then finally, when we do come to the point where we understand what it is we need to be praying for us, and it's right before us, we lack the ability to sustain ourselves in that prayer. We lack a sense of the proper urgency or passion equal to the issues that are before us. You have the disciples who go with the Lord Jesus into the Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord Jesus has been all along preparing them for the moment of what's coming ahead. The shepherd is going to be stricken and all the sheep are going to wander. Satan, Peter, Peter Satan is asked to sift you as wheat. He's coming to tempt you. And he goes off to pray and he takes James and John and Peter and says, stay here and pray with me. And then we're told that the Lord Jesus returns and they're asleep. He wakes them up. Could you not watch with me for one single hour? Watch and pray lest you fall into temptation. There's your prayer need. You need to pray because there's some significant temptation coming your way. Pray that you don't fall into temptation. There's serious things that are before us at this moment. The spirit is willing, but I know your flesh is weak. He left and he prays again and he comes back and he finds them sleeping again. And he leaves again. He says, you're he says some of the time, I know that it says they were sleeping good because their eyes were heavy. And he returns a third time, sleeping again, sleeping again. Sometimes I know that something really big is afoot. I know that something very serious is happening. I can see the issues that need to be prayed for, and it's just then I'm so overwhelmed by their weight that I'm just tired. <laughs> and instead of being able to pray, I want to sleep. It's my weakness in prayer comes upon us. I, I see the serious of matter, but I, I'm not urgent enough in my prayers. I'm not anguished enough in my prayers. I'm not trusting enough in my prayer. I'm not clinging enough in my prayers. I'm not claiming and trusting and resting enough in my prayer. And I don't know how to pray as I ought. That's what Paul says. That's the sum up of our weaknesses. Such a string of needs, it's hard to identify them. When, when you do identify a need, it's not the important one. It's not the thing that really needs to be addressed. And then when you know what needs to be addressed, you just don't have the energy to do it, as you should. And Paul says, in a sense, that's what it's like for us. We're weak in this area of prayer. And so here is a note for you. 
as a starting point, and this will be our second point here, but the, the secret to powerful praying is to know just that. To know that you're weak in this. That uh, Be careful if you come to a conclusion in your life that you're a prayer warrior. You know, that your gifting is, ah, I'm really good at praying. I, just be careful. Actually, be careful uh, if you become really proficient and eloquent, sustained prayers. The most effective prayers are the ones that you stay in really short, succinct sentences, like, Lord, help me, I'm sinking. And his hand goes out to grab hold of you and pull you up. No, it might be dangerous if we become confident in the sense that we are competent in our address of God and there develops within us as well a sense of complacency and, uh, and a casualness in his presence. Those who have prayed, who have really prayed, have come to that prayer with a sense of their utter uh, inabilities against the innumerable needs that they face and their ignorance of knowing what to say and in that they pray and God hears them and I... I have to say to you that, to my mind, oftentimes the prayer that I think that God hears the most, and I'm, I'm, I don't want to give myself as an example, and I don't want to hear an amen to this, but it's, Lord, I am really, really, really stupid. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know what's before me. And I need your help, and I need your wisdom, and I need your direction, and I need an answer from you, and... God hears that kind of prayer. In fact, a good prayer starts and builds upon a recognition that we don't know how to pray as we ought. It starts with a recognition that we are weak in this very important thing. Not, not moving away from the command. It's been commanded for us. So here, here's the deal. Know that you're weak, but keep praying. Keep doing it because it's commanded. Know that you're weak, but keep doing it because it's an instinct that God's put in you. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, you have an instinct to talk to Him and speak to Him. So keep praying, keep meeting with Him and and, and I know that he's told you how to begin. Say, our Father. Just start it as simple. Oh, Father, right? I come to you in Jesus' name. Come there, right? And then tread into those areas where he's called you to pray. That's a good start. But then rely upon him. It's a good point to build on, and here's why. And this is the second point. When you recognize your complete and utter weakness, it's at that point that the Holy Spirit begins to pray for us with unutterable groans. It's at this point that the Spirit begins to pray for us. We are not to stop praying because just at the point where we recognize our weakness in the prayer, we are promised that the Spirit comes in to help us carry the load, grab the other side. There are some commentators that take that passage where it speaks of the Spirit groaning and they, they want to interpret it mean that we groan somehow and they want to extract the spirit of out of because they think it doesn't it's not a dignified expression of the work of the spirit but James tells us that the spirit yearns over the believer the spirit who dwells in us yearns over the believer with a jealous envy you find that in James chapter 4 verse 5 and and Ephesians chapter 4 30 and 31 tells us that we're not to grieve the Holy Spirit who is within us that we're to let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from us. And just so you know, a spirit who can jealously yearn over us and a spirit who can be grieved by our choices and our decisions is a spirit who also can groan over us as he longs for and he hovers over us in our prayers. You'll find in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ that there are times when his prayer is expressed merely as a lifting up of his eyes and a sighing. Not words being expressed, just a sigh of prayer before God. And There are times when the issues before us are so deep and wondrous and so profound and the need that is, is so beyond our ability to communicate it that it rests merely in the sighs of God. Only the unutterable groans of the triune God can fully sound out the depth of your need and mine. And only even the unutterable groans of God can express the deep, overwhelming, loving desire that He has for us. So the Spirit does. At the very moment where your weakness begins to manifest itself, as you're praying, He comes along and He blends Himself into it to intercede with us in, in groans that can't be uttered. Here's the third thing. This intercession of the Holy Spirit takes place within our hearts. 
This intercession of the Holy Spirit takes place within our hearts. We as Christians are temples of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? The Holy Spirit lives in my heart, and the Holy Spirit, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ and received Him as your Savior, He, he lives inside of you. He, he lives inside the inner man, and there He lives to intercede. He lives to pray for you and me. He lifts up uh, within you as you begin to pray in your weakness. He grabs hold of that prayer with you. He begins to pray alongside of you, from within you, praying over your ignorance that God would accomplish His perfect will in your life, that God would bring to fruition all of His divine purposes for you. And He, he blends His prayer with you. And God the Father receives the prayer of the Spirit accordingly because He he knows the perfect will, His perfect will, and the Spirit of God measures out our perfect needs, our complete needs, and brings it before the Father. And The Lord Jesus, after He died and rose from the dead, the Bible says He ascended into heaven, and Hebrews 7, verse 25, says that He lives there now to make intercession for us, that, the, that the, our Savior ever lives to present the sacrifice of Himself for our sins, and He intercedes for us on our behalf. He's the great mediator interceding for us. So Christ is now occupying the, the temple of the highest heavens, interceding in our place. But at the very time in which he did that, after he ascended to heaven, the Bible says he sent his Holy Spirit to us to come and live and abide within us. And as the Lord Jesus is in the highest heavens, interceding in our place, dwelling in the temple not made with hands, the Holy Spirit is dwelling in the temple of our hearts, interceding for us as well. Christ intercedes in the highest heaven, and the Holy Spirit intercedes in the heart of the believer, right here, inside of us, calling out of it. How wonderful. What a, what a picture of the deep, profound provision that God has made for us, that our prayer, this labor He's given us, but that God would receive it. It comes to God through the intercessions of our Savior Jesus Christ in the temple in heaven, and it it cries out and it rises up from us, from the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. And as we begin to lift ourselves and engage in the work of prayer, comes alongside of us to carry that load and pray out and groan in ways that we cannot even pray ourselves from deep within us. I have, at times, uh, listened to my wife put my kids to bed and uh, listened to, I know something of my wife's prayer life because I listen to the prayer she prays with my children. And they're wonderful, and they're simple, and they're good. And maybe you remember that as a little girl or a little boy when your mother or your parents put you to bed and she prayed at your bedside and prayed with you. And I have the images of that as well that come through my mind. And maybe you also came upon those moments in time when you found uh, your mother was praying by your bedside just for you. You weren't there, but she was praying, and you overheard her prayers, and... I have some memories like that too. This is, in many ways, a picture of an expression of the warm-hearted prayer and intercession the Spirit is engaged in for us. William Henderson says this, Christ's intercessions may be compared with that of a father, the head of the family, for all the family members. The Holy Spirit's intercessions remind us, rather, of a mother kneeling at the bedside for her ailing child and in her prayer, presenting that child's need to the Heavenly Father. Should that encourage you in prayer? To know that you don't pray alone? To know in your weakness and in the challenges that you have that the Spirit of God is there to aid and guide you? That church in Rome was about ready to go into some very difficult challenges. Because of their profession of faith in Jesus Christ, and because they're going to take up the mantle to take that gospel to that Roman world, they're going to experience profound persecutions and difficulties and challenges. And they're going to be driven into prayer at times of deep desperation. And here's the comfort that the Spirit of God is going to be praying with you. And Paul is going to go on now and give them wonderful encouragement of what God is going to accomplish. God is going to fulfill all of His purposes for you. And God and, and nothing will be able to separate you from God's love and God's design and God's plan for your life and Wonderful encouragement, but it begins here. Pray, pray, pray. The Spirit of God will intercede and groan for you as you're praying. 
This is not a point of the message, but I think sometimes our prayers get dialed into safe things for ourselves. We're just praying. There's a song that was written by Keith Green. and uh, One of the lines was, Bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. You know, it's all I ever hear. No one aches, no one hurts, no one even sheds one tear. But he cries, he weeps, and he pleads for your needs. And you just lay back and keep soaking it in. There is a tendency in the Christian life to make prayer just somehow a warm blanket that we sleep with as we're just pursuing our own comforts. I'm not speaking about that kind of prayer. I'm speaking about a church that awakens to its mission and looks before a world that is seeking the destruction of his own and comes against it, arming itself in the, in the panoply and in the, in the armor of Christ, being all things to them, going out to engage their lives at a risk to take the gospel to lost and dying people who are facing a Christless eternity and in the middle of it and are, and are seedingly and begging God for their children and saying, God, I'm not going to let go of you until you answer this prayer. And they're, they're, facing, they're stepping out in faith in areas where the, 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 the task and the mission is overwhelming to them. And they feel their weakness and their inability and they cry out, oh, that God would move upon us with a sense of the ineffectualness of our prayer, only because we see the mission before us so great, and we say, God, we don't know how to pray, but we need your help. We need you to work. We need you to express yourself to us. So as I say this, and I, it's like I, I want to say, don't just compute this to you. Yes, God is available to you in the minor things. The truth is that when I go to a hardware store, I oftentimes pray that I get the right light bulb. I don't know what the right light bulb is. That Lord, help me find the right light bulb. And that's fine. That's fine. He's with us just in the basic issues of life to be there and meet with us and fellowship with them. All good. But if that's all there is, not all good. God, help me find the right light in my home so my home can be a place where I read your word and study your word and pray of your word and bring your word to others. Help my life, my house become a light where I receive people so I can tell them about the Savior and about you. Help me be obedient to the call you've placed upon my life to go to the ends of the earth. Give me wisdom. That kind of praying. The Spirit joins with us with utter groans that cannot be uttered. Here's the last point here. Not only does the Spirit pray within us in this way, The Father hears the prayer of the Spirit on the behalf of His children, and He receives it. The Bible reveals that God knows all. He knows what's in every heart. Let me read to you some passages. 1 Samuel 16, 7. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For the Lord looks at the... Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Kings 8, 39. You alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. 1 Chronicles 28, 9. The Lord searches all hearts and understands all the intent of the thoughts. Acts 1, 24. The disciples getting ready to start off on their mission. The Lord Jesus has ascended. They're waiting in the upper room. They're praying that God would help them select the right leaders. Their first statement is, Lord, you know everyone's heart. You know our hearts. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. It speaks of a day when the Lord will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. God knows everything. He sees everything. That might not be a comfort to you. It might be a problem for you to think that God knows everything. You don't really want him reading everything that comes to your mind or your heart. He does. He knows it all. He sees it all. In fact, the Bible says he's, he's coming one day to, to reveal all the things that are done in secret, all the hidden things that are done in secret, and our mind can project out to the judgment seat and the horror of meeting him when... Not only all the things you've done, you know, sometimes we have in our mind that there's going to be this movie reel playing of all the bad things we've done, but it's, it's not just that. It's all the bad things we thought. All these things are going to be played out. And one day he's going to sort all this out in a judgment. But that passage that's speaking to the believer where it says the Lord Jesus will return and reveal all the hidden things done in the heart, uh, done in the person's heart, all those secret things. Then it says this, the next line, it's in, it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And each man speaking to the believer, will receive his praise of God. Something's changed in the heart of a believer. 
Our heart is not the reservoir of deceit and dishonesty and lies and manipulation and selfish pursuits. It's, it's in my flesh, but our heart has changed. We've been given a new heart. You know what's in my heart? The Holy Spirit groaning and praying for me. The Holy Spirit countering the influences and appetites of my flesh and praying that Christ might be glorified through me and might fulfill his purposes and his designs. And in the middle of all of it, there's times when I wonder, and you might wonder what your motivation is for doing even good things. Lord, was it a good motivation or a bad motivation? Was this wood, hay, and stubble, or was this gold, silver, and precious stone? You don't always know. You will one day. For the believer, the wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn away. The gold, silver, and precious stone is going to remain, and out of it, God is going to craft a crown to put upon your head. And each man will receive his praise of God. Here's the point I'm making to you. That we don't need to be afraid that God knows everything that's going on in the deep hearts and our deep souls. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, I can tell you what's going on there. The Holy Spirit is abiding in your life, crying out and groaning for you with words that cannot be uttered. There's a change that's come over you. You've been transformed. You, you'll be glad to know that you'll be glad to know what God knew was going on in your heart during the sojourn if you've given your life to Jesus Christ. You'll be glad to know it. That he saw all those things that he was provoking and stirring up because of what he'd made you to be. And he saw that your heart yearned to please him and honor him in the midst of the confusion and the difficulty and even the failure of your own flesh. That there was in you this desire to please and serve him. And the call to prayer is to stir that up to stir up those good, God-given longings your heart and to bring them in force against all the power of the world that's opposed to you and the devil that's opposed to you and your own flesh that betrays you and stir it up so that with, in that prayer and the weakness of your prayer, the Spirit of God would come in, rise up and groan for you and bring before you these needs. And as you go on, you'll find out the wonderful promises that it, the purpose of the design of God is going to be fulfilled. The next verse says, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God is going to answer the deep longing of the spirit and the spirit of the born again man and woman. He's going to answer those prayers. He's going to fulfill them. In fact, we'll go on and read on to the passage. He's going to glorify you. He's going to bring you into complete glory. So here's the application. This ministry of the Holy Spirit is not provided for all people. It's His work for His people, those who put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and those whom He occupies because of that faith. First, don't despair that you don't know how to pray as you should. None of us do. Second, don't stop praying. Pray away. The Spirit doesn't pray instead of you. He helps you in your weakness. In your weakness, He prays with you. So weak as you are, pray. Pray, pray, pray. Third, know in this, as you pray, he's praying, praying within you. He's within you, praying. Thank him then forth that he has brought this regenerative life to you, changing the equation of your heart, inhabiting it with himself, filling it with his prayers on your behalf. Let's bow our heads. Possibly, oh God, our prayers have most closely aligned with the Spirit within us when we've lost words and we've just sighed before you. We've come to a point where we've just said, oh God, oh God, dear Lord Jesus, Oh, dear Lord Jesus. We thank you, O oh God, that there's a translator within us who knows us better than we know ourselves and also knows your perfect design for us. He takes those times and he translates his longing desires for us. And we thank you, dear God, that you've not removed us from this calling. You've called us to the dignity of causality, of agency, 
You've commanded us to pray. We thank you that you've not left us alone in these commands, but you've given us your spirit to guide us. We give you glory. Now, oh God, we want to pray for one another. We want to be found pouring out our hearts for our neighbors. We want to be praying and pleading for our nation. We want, oh God, to be praying for the nation of Israel. We might read in the scriptures and see what things are coming and what you've planned for all the nations. But, oh God, you've made us a part of praying, seeking to preserve, seeking to be light, seeking to somehow, oh God, even stave off the hand of judgment, your hand, in order that at the right time, in your fullness of time, you would release, oh God, your purposes and your designs. Whatever, Lord. Whatever it is, wherever we see, oh God, may we look upon our lives, the lives of others, our world, with praying eyes, praying hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.